Hi, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to speak today. It is always a pleasure to speak um, to the, the friends and family, peers and, and professionals that are part of the OLE Foundation and who attend the OLE Conference. Today, I'm going to be speaking about my journey as a patient advocate and a little bit about my own patient story because it, it really drives and it influences the purpose into my advocacy. My disclosure for, to, for today's presentation is that I am a consultant for Lift Echo. Lift Echo stands for Learn Intestinal Failure Tele-Echo, which I'll talk about briefly later in the presentation, and uh, Dr. Iyer and Dr. Winkler will also talk about. My story starts 32 years ago when I was born with short bowel syndrome in 1989, actually almost now 33 years ago next, next month. Uh, I was born with a congenital defect, intestinal atresia, and at two days old, I had uh, immediate surgery to get rid of the, atresia, uh, the bowel that had atresia in it and um, connect what was remaining and, and leave me with some ostomies as well as central line and feeding tube. And the t at the time in 1989, uh, the literature for TPN, long-term TPN wasn't great. The prognosis was really unknown. And it was actually the physician that said, you should take one day at a time. And that is exactly what we did. Really appreciating each day and each milestone that I was able to, to hit. But really understanding that this is a journey versus really have, um, a marker of milestones. And with that, we developed our own normal, um, which many, normal is different for everyone. My, fav my favorite quote about normal is, normal is just a drier setting. So I developed my own normal. And so for me, that was, I being on, that was being on TPN uh, for the last 29 years of the, th of the 32 years. I have been on TPN anywhere from as minimum as three nights a week to as many as seven nights a week, getting it nightly, eight hours a night, 12 hours a night, 16 hours a night, getting some of my calories from it or all of my calories for from it. I also have been, um, re have received enteral nutrition um, or tube feeding through a gastrostomy tube from since childhood for about uh, 24, 25 years, and 20 of those years have actually been for feeding. Um, so I would go to school just like my peers, but with my tube feeding backpack, and it looked exactly like it looks on the right in the inside, and then we outfitted it and customized it to match my, my desires, which was a hot pink, Mickey Mouse stickers, etc. And this is kind of uh, me, an ep epitome of me in childhood, which is um, sitting outside, headband, watch, and eating chips, salty chips. If I were to eat anything, I, were, I was going to eat salty chips. I, I ate like a bird. I didn't eat much. I would eat the same food or drink the same drink for hours at a time. Um, but we all, as a team and as a family, we, we knew the importance of it exposing myself to food, although I may not have eaten much of it. I even sometimes pretended to eat and fooled a lot of people. So most, if not all, my calories came from the tube feeding and the TPN. So in 32 years, I've had, tw I've been on TPN for 29 of those years and have had, and have had 31 central lines. Of those 31 central lines, 27 have been infected with bacterial or fungal infections. Last year, uh, la almost a year ago, last July, I had a central line infection after almost 15 years of no infections. And unfortunately, um, the it was in the track. We had to take the central line out. We tried to save it, but we ended up having to take it out. And when we took it out, we learned that that was my last access point in the neck and both sides of the neck. So I'm no longer on TPN and I no, I no longer have a central line and it's been, it's been a little over a year. In those 32 years, I've had many central line placements, many abdominal surgeries, complications, 
and more that have resulted in a total of 67 surgeries. Uh, though as recent as two weeks ago, I had surgery. My care has spanned across 10 different hospitals in the US. Um, some of these hospitals were used for consultation for subspecialty care and trying to seek right care at the right place at the right time. This is something that I learned late in life, I think, in, in my 20s, but is so important in the rare disease journey and in the short bowel syndrome intestinal failure journey. But it is so hard to achieve. Um, uh, when I transitioned from pediatrics, I was, I was referred to an adult subspecialty center about 12 hours away from home. And we did gut rehab as much as we could, and then we were we were offered surgery. And as a team, we agreed to go with surgery. And unfortunately, I had complications, more surgeries at different hospitals, more complications, which were fistulas. I ended up having fistulas between my small intestine, large intestine, skin, and bladder. I was miserable. I was raw both inside and out. I was depressed. I had bio leaking nonstop. I left college. Uh, and we really didn't know what to do. And so we, we learned the hard way. We had to put my health in our own hands. And as a family, we traveled across the country, 12 hours to cold country, 12 hours to the beach and more, seeking subspecialty care. And we realized that we were fortunate as a family to, to do that, but also if one place was not the right option, we could continue to seek options. And that's not always the situation. Um, in searching for right care at the right place at the right time and getting advice from multiple providers, we made the hard decision of doing of taking out the small intestine that I had fought for my entire life up until that point. And then I was dependent on a G tube to gravity, gravity drainage, no food by mouth, and I was completely dependent on TPN and IV fluids for almost three years. It was then that I made the hard decision to have a small intestine transplant almost eight years, I mean, no, more than eight years ago now. At the time, I, my health, it was, it was either staying the same or getting worse. I, there was no moving forward. I had exhausted all my options. And for me personally, I wanted to move forward and I wanted to exhaust all my options in, in, in the journey of short bowel syndrome, even if that meant the risk of death. I made the decision to have a transplant. Uh, and now eight years later, I've had a lot of highs, um, including getting off, I mean, having, getting off TPN, um, getting back on TPN and now getting back off TPN. Um, but things that, probably I'm, I'm more grateful for are no pain before, during, or after eating. Um, I have solid stool some days and I can eat more than I have ever eaten in my life, which is still very little to the average person, but that's okay. Again, my normal. Uh, but the I also still have symptoms. And I, I say that I have short bowel syndrome until the day I die. Um, I may have very mild um, short bowel syndrome now today, but because I don't have um, a colon, I have an ileostomy. So I, my main symptom is diarrhea. And I do have to be very diligent on hydration as well as of course, nutrition. But in midst of the highs, I mean, there have been lows. Um, transplant is not a cure. It can be an exchange of hardships for some. I'm not gonna go through each complication, but these are the complications that I've experienced in the last eight years. Um, one is the post-transplant lymphoproliferative disorder, PTLD, um, which is a rare disease in itself. And it is a type of cancer that is seen post solid organ transplant or post stem cell transplant. Most of these complications are listed in literature or, or, or are known as complications post transplant. Um, other thing I wanted to note is avascular necrosis of hips and shoulders. So avascular necrosis means uh, avascular, so lack of blood supply. 
to the joint, to the ball of the joint, and the ball of the joint starts to collapse, unfortunately, um, or necrotize. And so the only long-term solution um, is for for the AVN etiology or is bilateral or hip replacements, excuse me, joint replacements. So I've had bilateral hip replacements at the age of 26, and then just two weeks ago had my first shoulder replacement. And then post-transplant, um, as a family and as a team, we learned that I never truly learned how to eat. The surgeon said, we fixed you, go and eat. And it was a shock to all of us that it, I had a really hard time maintaining enough or maintaining the regimen as well as being able to intake enough calories to rely on oral nutrition alone. And so I lost a lot of weight, I got very dehydrated and had to get back on TPN and IV fluids and um, maintain that cushion to be able to have physical, mental, and emotional energy week to week until last year. And we transitioned to G2 feedings instead. And thankfully, I have surpassed the volume and rate that I had as a kid that we always struggled with and have been able to succeed on G2 feedings as well as oral nutrition with the understanding that I am meeting with a dietitian that focuses in rest on restrictive intake. Um, she usually meets with people that have eating disorders. Although this is not an eating disorder, it is a type of disordered eating that can come from this from the journey of intestinal failure, shore bowel syndrome, long-term tubes and IVs. And so it has been a journey in itself working with this dietitian in terms of learning, learning how to eat with the anatomy and symptoms um, that I have. The other thing we learn post-transplant is, of course, I'm a complicated case. I was, I am, and I will be. Um, one of the first, probably, I would say, advocacy um, efforts that I took on um, that was the most personal advocacy effort was finding the right uh, provider. And ha I don't live at the the transplants. I don't live in the city where the transplant was, was and that's the case for many people. And so I had to learn how to work with the local team as well as the transplant team and, and quickly found that I had a lot more needs that were beyond the scope of the intestine and transplant. And so I took it onto myself to find the pit crew. And so today, this is our multidisciplinary um, intestinal failure team that we're proud and happy to have. But as you can see, they are all over the US. Some are private practitioners, some are um, part of multidisciplinary intestinal failure gut rehab teams at academic university centers. So I'm gonna talk more about the advocacy part of this journey, but I want everyone to understand this is all parallel to living life with short bowel syndrome and um, dealing with the, the side effects of your health as well as complications, but advocacy is always part of it. And I think it's an innate part of all of us. My really light bulb moment in advocacy truly came after the transplant because I had the transplant at 24. So it was in my early 20s, it was the first time I really was taking ownership of my own health. I was no longer, um, sitting quietly in clinic and my parents were answering most of the questions um i can i at 24 can finally articulate my own medical journey and understood most of everything so i was taking on more ownership and in return really started noticing the healthcare arena and noticing how the patient voice wasn't being heard like i wanted it to be and I thought we could do better. So after the transplant and in, in the recovery, uh, I was trying to find what do I do with my life? <laughs> I'm 24, I finished, I'd finished college right before the transplant. And I, in hopes if, you know, the goal of 
any surgery we do to improve patient outcomes is, is for the purpose of patients ourselves to live our life. So how was I going to live my life? And I thought, well, let me volunteer first because I don't know what my stamina is like and I don't know what I can do. And so the first thing I did was outreach to people in our own network at the Oli Foundation. Uh, it was another, it was a mother of a peer who is my age and she, I knew, was already in advocacy. So I reached out to her and she gave me some tips and told me where to think about jobs, where to internship. And so I started reaching out to those individuals. And eventually um, I, I had different opportunities with different organizations and the advocacy journey has evolved in different ways. As you can see, just from these pictures, some have been um, patient advocacy recordings about central line infections, minimization of central line infections. Another one is going to Capitol Hill and, and speaking on policy. And another one is um, giving keynotes at patient experience conferences on healthcare delivery, patient experience, pros, the positive stories, as well as what can we learn from some of the negative stories. So I'm going to go in more detail of how that came about. But first, these are kind of my tenets of advocacy. I'm going to, I'm calling them approaches to advocacy because a tenet seems like a very strong word. But I want to have, I want everyone to understand that advocacy comes in many forms. What I describe in my own journey is just some of, some ways of doing advocacy. For example, I don't talk a lot about blog writing or publishing, um, narratives and things like that, but that's a form of advocacy as well. If you take anything away from this, please, please remember you are your best advocate. It, it's surprising how, how few times we share that with others. Nobody ever told me that growing up. Nobody ever told me that as I started going into advocacy, but it's true. You know your story best. You know your experiences best, and that's really valuable. You don't have to be an advocate at all times, all places. So a lot of times there's seasons of advocacy. Um, before the pandemic, I was traveling a lot, speaking a lot. I was doing more advocacy than I am now. One, because of the pandemic, but also because of my health and other reasons. And so that, that can ebb and flow as it matches to your own journey. And so in the same vein, your needs, your desires in advocacy, where you, the niches you have, that can evolve, the satisfaction you have in advocacy, that can all evolve as uh, your journey as a parent, caregiver, patient, loved one, etc. progresses. And I've found that personally for me, and I know for others, advocacy in whatever way it is can be a form of coping. If you are interested in getting into advocacy, I have people ask me, how did you get involved? How did you get started? One is speaking up about your desire to get more involved. And that is to the Ole Foundation, that is to me, that is to other peers, whoever you are talking to. I really believe in um, speaking out loud what you wish for. Um, and you would be surprised what other people will take from from that and but also research research what other advocates are doing other organizations are doing how they're doing advocacy how they're writing how they're what they're talking about is that something you relate to or you say hey well that's a great narrative but they didn't think about this side of it i can offer that side of it and connect connect with one another I've learned a lot from different peers, and I hope I've been able to advise uh, peers who've, who've come in contact with me. Advocacy per perpetuates advocacy. Uh, when you get started, when you start doing things, the space is small and big. So people uh, recognize uh, when there's when someone is speaking up and presenting advocating for policy or, or finding their niche and they will reach out if 
if, if they start seeing that you are showing up and doing what you desire and wish for. And then lastly, and again, if you take anything away from this is advocacy is fed by grit. And what I mean by grit is yes, perseverance, but perseverance for the long run. It doesn't, it's not a one and done. Um, unfortunately, healthcare advocacy, the healthcare arena is really built to drain a lot of, a lot of us who are participate in it. And I, I don't think that's, I think everyone knows that in a way. And, and so it, it really does require perseverance and, and you will be discouraged. But to remember, this is a, this is a marathon. This is a, this is for the long haul. Um, I may present today, but it's really the foundations, the connections, the networks, the, that we're creating month to month, years to come to then maybe see a policy come forward years from today or uh, a system change months or hopefully months from today but, or years from today. So the first thing that I started with when I, when I started getting more involved in a, one form of advocacy and that was uh, legislative advocacy was working with what I had. So as I said, I, inter I, I went to a peer who was a mother of a, of a son who has intestinal failure and she connected me with um, another organization to possibly intern or volunteer. So I reached out to them and told them what I am able to offer. And at the time uh, I had organization skills and I could maybe make an agenda, gave some very simple things I could do. <laughs> well, it turned out into a very big thing. So I ended up going to one of their patient conferences in a nearby city and I, I actually asked if I could help, but also if I could speak at one of their events, because that's also what I was very interested in doing. And instead they said, that's great, but we need you to organize a state house advocacy day. We're now doing that in every state. And I had no idea what that was. I had never been to our capital at the state house. I've never I've been, this, been to the state house at our state capital. But I said yes. <laughs> I said yes. So the the left picture is us doing the event, and I knew how to use social media and I knew how to use email. And so I created an agenda and I sent it to the emails they had given me and just blasted it on social media. But I had no idea how to work with legislators. These two legislators were the only people who showed up. Little did I know that. Uh, the lady on the right is the chair of the health committee and a very important person in our legislature. So fast forward to the next year, we were able to expand it because I was able to learn from what I did the previous year. And then fast forward another year, we're passing policy with that legislator. Uh, we also partnered with different universities in the state to host a symposium, all from starting with what I have and networking. The other advice I got was connect with national organizations and conferences. And so these are a few of the national organizations in the rare disease space, including the Ole Foundation. The Ole Foundation logo is, is conveniently in the bottom right corner, so I didn't repeat it. Um, Aspen is a professional society for providers who treat patients on parenteral and enteral nutrition. Global Genes is a rare disease organization, National Rare Disease Organization, NORD, National Organization for Rare Disorders. The Every Life Foundation is a rare disease organization. They host a, um, a rare disease week on Capitol Hill every year. And Patients and Providers for Medical Nutrition Equities are, is a coalition to pass policy for um, coverage of medical nutrition. And you may recognize Betty Marie. So when I connected with these national national organizations, I made sure to ask questions and always offered, how can I help? Because I wanted to get involved. And again, advocacy perpetuates advocacy. And then now it's become a process of 
keeping in touch with different organizations, helping them in different ways. I now consult with certain um, entities and organizations, but essentially I'm never stopping advocating or I never stop advocating. And I got, I met our Senator, Senator Jones, Doug Jones from Alabama. And he gave us this quote that I always love. And it says, keep up the advocacy, never ever stop. And as I said, advocacy is sped by grit. It, it is a long-term process. And so what motivates me to not stop advocating? Because it can be tiring. And as I said, the, the arena can be built to drain us at times. Sometimes we think of success as a policy being passed or that program being put forward or whatever that end result was we wanted. We think if we get that, that's our definition of success and nothing else is successful. So one was learning that that's not definition of success and advocacy. And I really believe that every effort that you put forward is a part of the success and to keep at it. And that is sending an email, uh, speaking up, sending that message to a peer to ask, hey, can we talk? And, uh, or learning from others, I mean, any effort. And then the other one is, and this helps me the most when I get nervous in clinic situations or in healthcare situations where uh, I, I need to speak up, but I'm scared. And I remember that at the end of the day, you have to forget my family, my brother, my friends, my peers. It is me. I have to look at myself in the mirror. It is me wearing the TPN backpack, wearing the intro nutrition backpack, living with short bowel syndrome, intestinal failure. Did I do everything in my control um, in regards of advocating or speaking up? Okay, and I know this slide is an oxymoron, but it's purposeful. <laughs> There's a purpose. So one, in advocacy, a degree of any kind is not necessary. Again, as I said, your story, you know your story best and your story is valuable. Your, your experience is valuable. That is the basis, I, I believe, of advocacy. Now, in parallel to this advocacy journey, I, I, and I got a master's after I felt better post-transplant. I went back to school and got a master's in public health and healthcare organization and policy. So why? So as a career, I started figuring out and realizing that I really did have a passion in changing systems from a national or global level. And I really wanted to change the healthcare system. I did internships at the hospital and they would say, oh, what do you want to do in your career? And I would look right at them these nurses and say, oh, I'm going to change the healthcare system. And they would just have eyes, deer, deer in the headlights look and kind of laugh. I didn't get it at all. I didn't understand. I said, of course, I'm going to change the healthcare system. Now I understand. So one, it is very complicated. Um, there's niches to the healthcare system, but two, as a mentor has told me, a healthcare is not a system. And I, I say that with utmost respect of everyone who's part of healthcare, including myself. And that is because when we have stress to healthcare, it can fall apart as, as it can with, with our disease, with our disease journey. But what I realized is and learned through my experiences is a lot of times to create change in healthcare, you have to show the evidence. Um, a, evidence-based change. So let's say there's, um, they want to implement a new program at, at the local hospital. They, a lot of times they need to see a pilot program or something that, sh that shows that this will work in their hospital. They want to see data. And I wanted to be part of creating that data, doing the research and providing the evidence to make the change. And I wanted it to come from the patient voice and the community. So I got passionate in community driven research and healthcare organization. And, uh, and then I brought in my experience with healthcare policy and made that into a master's in public health. So, that is how I 
got into the Echo, um, Lift Echo project, which I'm going to talk about briefly. And again, Dr. Iyer and Dr. Winkler will talk about more. So I was familiar with Echo and telemedicine um, because of the journey that I had trying to seek subspecialty care from all over the country and really missing and not understanding why telemedicine could not have been utilized. And this was all before the pandemic. I was at the conference where Dr. Iyer presented the launch of Lift Echo and immediately chased him down and asked if I could help in any way. He may not appreciate, but at the time he said, not right now, but then later on, a couple years later this year, he reached back out. And there is now a grant that we have applied for um, to study the, the Lift Echo model, which is a virtual online platform of multidisciplinary providers who are engaging in, uh, in helping manage intestinal failure patients by uh, reviewing cases, as well as um, hearing didactic presentations. And the website is below and you can peruse, browse it. It is designed for the provider. So we wanna see if this model uh, of teaching providers management of intestinal failure is actually improving patient outcomes. So my role in the project is to make sure the patient voice is incorporated in the study design and the patient um, is included in as, a, as active participants. And that um, we do have patient engagement and, and we make sure we disseminate our findings in a grassroots manner as the findings uh, come. They're not there yet. We haven't started just yet. And the goal, we have goals of hopefully um, improving lift echo or, or um, designing lift echo in a way where it can be more patient facing hopefully at, um, someday and the last um, advocacy research uh, point i want to talk about is the gutsy perspective and so this is a research a community driven research initiative to study quality of life um, in the shore bowel syndrome patient and caregiver population that we started as it's led by three parent advocates who are also researchers as well as one community leader and myself. Um, our PI is Dr. Mercer. We have an advisor also from an Omaha. And we do have a industry grant just for the research part. This is a quite novel initiative because Traditionally, quality of life research, at least for pediatric shore bowel syndrome patients, has really been focused on limitations and Ill, Ill being versus well being and what can we do versus what we cannot do. And there ha up until this point, there has never been a tool that has been created specific, a quality of life tool created specifically for the short bowel syndrome population. So as you can maybe imagine, um, the use of generic quality of life tools don't always assess um, adequately the experiences of somebody living with short bowel syndrome. And then the guts, with the gutsy perspective, we're making sure this is community driven. So we are building a short bowel syndrome quality of life survey to align with community priorities and by using both quantitative and quality, qualitative data. Our, we uh, did an exploratory study with the stakeholder committee, which were uh, parents in the short bowel syndrome community last year. And we published those findings in the Journal of Pediatric Surgery last October. It'll actually come out in print in, the, in September. Um, and you can get you, this is a summary of some of the findings. This is also on our website. In light of time, I'm going to go move forward. Um, but we also have our website, thegutsyperspective.org, which you can review all of this, read the article, and I hope you do. But right now, there's two projects that you can very much get involved in that we'd love for you to um, get involved in. And, and that's also a form of advocacy, especially in terms of really hearing the voices of kids and teens with short bowel syndrome. 
because the tool is a pediatric quality of, of life tool, we want to hear from kids and teens with short bowel syndrome. And they will, will be able to hear about their experiences with short bowel syndrome. They can, they'll be able to meet others in their same age group through the focus group. The focus group will be led by uh, Marie Newman, who is a parent of a child with short bowel syndrome as, and a researcher, as well as Megan Raoun, who's the director of the Global Gastroschisis Foundation and a licensed mental health counselor. Uh, you can go to our website to sign up. We are in need of, really in need of um, teenagers 13 to 17 years old. And then we just launched today our Short Bowel Syndrome Awareness Month Gutsy Secret Campaign. Uh, so you'll see that on social media, but these are some examples of some secrets that have already been shared, which are people sharing some of their uh, innate or internal thoughts when coping with short bowel syndrome. So we'll, we'll have a collection of all the photos at the end of the month for you to see. Uh, with that, thank you.